Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1982 film The New York Ripper, and this is a Lucio Fulci film. And if people know me, they know that this is in my wheelhouse of one of my favorite subgenres of horror, which is Giallo, which was an Italian movement of these kind of mystery whodunit type things. They always have uh, people getting killed, usually slashed up, and it's usually like someone in a trench coat with black gloves, although that doesn't really happen in this. Uh, but that's kind of how it started. And Giallo, a lot of fun in my opinion. There's always some sort of twist. The whole thing is, fi let's figure out who's done this. And I think there are a lot of red herrings in this film, much like a lot of Giallo films. Some that I think worked pretty well and some that were kind of like, eh. But um, overall, it's okay as a Giallo film. This isn't one of my favorite Giallo films, but decent. So when I watched it, I watched it off the Blue Underground uh, Lucio Fulci Collection Blu-ray set that I got recently from Diabolic DVD when they were having their Blue Underground sale. But um, either when this review comes out or not long after, there should this movie, The New York Ripper, should be on Shutter streaming because Shutter is about to drop a lot of Giallo films in December, and uh, I'm getting very excited for it. So you may end up seeing a lot of reviews. So, this is not my first Fulci film I've done. I've done uh, a bunch, so I'm pretty familiar with Fulci's style. Uh, I actually have a whole playlist on the channel for Fulci reviews if you want to check that one out. And this will be in it as well. So, obviously, directed by Lucio Fulci. Uh, and this was the year after he did The Black Cat, The Beyond, and The House by the Cemetery. Yes, all three of those films came out in the same year. Of those three, I haven't seen The Black Cat, but I've seen The Beyond and The House by the Cemetery. Fun. Actually, House by the Cemetery is on here. And one of his favorite films of mine, The City of the Living Dead. It was written by Fulci, uh, along with a bunch of other dudes. Here are the other people. Dardano Sacchetti, who has worked with a lot of Italian directors in the past. Uh, he's done some scripts for things like Demons, Demons 2, 1990, The Bronx Warriors, The Scorpion with Two Tails, A Bay of Blood, and Cat O9 Tales. Uh, Vincenzo Menino, who was involved with scripts for Carnal Circuit, The Man with Icy Eyes, The Killer is on the Phone, Syndicate Sadists, Formula for a Murder, and Phantom of Death. I'm just naming some for all of these because they have a lot of writing credits on IMDb. Uh, Gianfranco Clarici, who's done The Bloodstained Butterfly, Don't Torture a Duckling, which is also a Lucio Fulci-directed film, Nazi Love Camp 27, Jungle Holocaust, Phantom of Death, and Cannibal Holocaust, which a lot of people will know that title, very infamous. Uh, this film, probably no surprise to people, was banned in the UK until 2002. It seems like the UK was banning all sorts of films, especially Italian films, because of their gore and violence. Uh, Fulci called this film a tribute to Alfred Hitchcock, which I guess I kind of see it... Um, it's a little different him saying it's a tribute to Hitchcock. That's fine if he would have said, this is my take on Hitchcock. or I would have rolled my eyes. I would have been like, oh, come on. But he said, tribute, fine. Sacchetti has said, uh, he on the record in an interview, had said that the sexual content in this came from Fulci and that he had a, quote, profound sadism towards women. I'm assuming this happened after Fulci was dead because... I don't know a friend, because Sacchetti and Fulci worked together a lot, and they were friends. I don't know a friend who would say something about you like that in person. I, it's it's weird. Uh, it's kind of messed up. So, um, Also, who were you as a person for a friend to actually say that publicly about you? It makes you wonder. Uh, and you do see it in the film, obviously. It is pretty brutal. It's very unflinching and showing a lot of violence towards women um, and a lot of sexuality as well. But I'll talk a little bit more about that stuff in a bit. The, read, the lead role for this was originally offered to Catri, uh, Catriona McCall, who had starred in City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, and The House by the Cemetery, but she ended up turning it down. She didn't really like the role. Fulci plays the chief of police in this, so look out for that. He's in there. And if people didn't catch it, Michel Suave, the guy who directed Stage Fright and has a very small part in Demons as the guy with like the half metal mask on giving out the tickets in the beginning of the film, he shows up very briefly in this film. Uh, he is buying a newspaper with what looks like his girlfriend at the newsstand 
when uh, Dr. Lodge is there buying some uh, pornography, which I think that that, by the way, I think that scene is supposed to be a red herring. And the reason I say that is because he's buying gay porn and then obviously it's, you know, uh, hidden in a newspaper by the person who he's purchasing it from. But I think that's supposed to be a hint to people that maybe he's the killer, give them that kind of idea, because maybe he hates women so much because he's not, you know. I, I think it's just supposed to plant that little seed. You know, obviously, remember, this was 1982, so, you know. People who were gay were, were shown in very different light back then, unfortunately. Uh, I saw it coming in this film in the very, very beginning of it that the dog would end up coming back with a severed hand where the guy's playing fetch with him. Um, as soon as that was going on, I was like, he's going to find a body. And then I started thinking while it was going on, what would he bring back? And I'm like, it's got to be a hand. That's kind of the only thing the dog could really bring back unless it's a foot or something. So I ended up being totally right. Um, it's weird that they then, though, focus on the severed hand and freeze frame on it to have the opening credits and title and everything. Um, it's kind of weird that they freeze on that. I find it kind of funny now, but the music that then kicks in is awesome. And that's one of the big things about giallo films and Italian horror in general from, from the time periods of like 60s, 70s, 80s, that uh, the music was so good, so interesting. But it's always mismatched for what you assume for horror. It's always very like upbeat and funky and fun. And I don't know, I just dig that about these Italian horror films. It's not the only thing, but it's one thing that I really like. And these songs, and it's no different in the New York Ripper, they just worm their way into your head. Like, literally, I was done watching this film, and hours later, I'm walking around the house humming the main tune to the film. They just, they're so catchy and fun. They do a good job of setting up a hustling and bustling city environment that conveys how people can just get lost and basically be forgotten. Um, you know, that's kind of a New York thing and how seedy it looks too. It looks very seedy. It looks very dark. It looks very shifty. Uh, but you can also see that with, with all the kind of deviant thing, deviant things going on with the live sex shows and tons of places for that, uh, that it just looks like people could just get lost. There's a lot of people that people just don't care about so much. So it creates this kind of dark, brooding disgusting type of environment which i think really elevates the overall um, atmosphere of the film itself the duck quacking of the killer is unbelievably weird i don't like i understand why it's done because this is kind of a callback for lucio fulci to don't torture a duckling because there's a donald duck um there's a donald duck figure that ends up being used in don't torture a duckling to signal who the killer may be. Uh, and that is done again in the New York Ripper, actually, with, you know, the girl in the hospital who's, you know, not going to live, Peter's daughter, Peter and Faye's daughter. Um, that girl not, um, having that duck doll, and that's supposed to be just like in Don't Torture a Duckling. It's supposed to signify, look here, there is a connection to the killer right here. So I think it's kind of fun that there's that, commonality between the two films um but the whole like making the killer quack i think that's a little bit extra um once again i understand how why you would do that but i i don't think that was necessarily needed because when you find out whose daughter that is that's the connection that's where you should be making the connection uh it's that extra step of having the killer then quack which you don't really need because then that's that's tying the quacking to the duck and then to the girl. You don't really need all that. All you need is the girl to the duck, and then that's, you know, who it's Peter's daughter. Like, really, that's all you needed. Um, the close-up stabbings and slashings are very effective in this because they're very, very violent. And they're very gory. But since they focus on them so much, it it kind of gives you enough time to really see how you, th how you could think they would have pulled it off. Like, you can see because it's so close up, that like when they're doing the slashings, especially the first one in the parked car on that ferry boat, um, that they probably, you know, they just had like fake skin and they had like a bunch of guts put in under it. And then they just, you know, did the slash and like pushed the guts out. Um, you know, it, it's pretty easy to see that stuff. The scene of the woman masturbating at the live sex show is excessively long. 
so much so that it's unbelievably boring. I understand the whole, you know, it's lurid, throw sexual content in there, all that type of stuff. And it was way more popular back in the 80s, 70s, all that. But uh, watching it nowadays, it's just like, it's boring. It's too much. Uh, and I think part of that has to do with the availability of pornography on the internet. Uh, just makes things like that less interesting. Uh, also, also very long and boring was the towing scene, I guess is what I would call it, instead of fingering the towing scene, where the guy's shoving his foot up the woman's vagina. I don't... Fulci and Sketty, weird, you know, they throw some weird things in there. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things. And even if you're going to do that, like, okay, fine. It's this weird, like, quirky thing. Why Why was the scene so long? It's just excessive. I think it was more, it seems more it was for their, their gratification than anything else. It's pretty funny when the Ripper ends up calling uh, Williams, the detective, and is doing that wacky voice over the phone, because uh, that's not just the quacking, but it's also his, you know, kind of changed voice, uh, which, you know, sounds cartoonish to match. Uh, it's weird and how, and, excuse me, it's weird how disinterested Williams is when he's being given the profile information on the Ripper by Dr. Lodge. And that happens a lot. A lot of the times when Dr. Lodge is kind of trying to feed information to Williams, he's... It looks like he's thinking about other things, and he's not very focused. He looks bored. He's not very interested. That's a weird aspect of the character of Williams, I think. I don't know if people agree with me on that or not. So the guy with the two fingers, I want to go to this. The scene where he's in bed with the woman, and then he gets up and he goes make a phone call. Obviously, in retrospect, when he's making that phone call, he turns the music up really far so the woman who's tied to the bed can't hear what he's saying. Um, obviously that's when he's calling Peter because they reveal later that Peter was using that guy, Mickey, to, um, to basically find women, to bring women to him. And then he would end up killing them while well, torturing and killing them. Um, but th with that scene, like then he falls asleep and she's, uh, uh, becomes awake and she wants to get away. The, the moment where like he kind of wakes up and then he's like groping her in her sleep. Is that legitimately what's happening? It's like it's sleep groping going on with that dude. Your opinion. I don't know. It was weird. Uh, when the woman in the hotel gets carved up, for, you know, this is right after that scene I just talked about. Uh, it's shot really well. I like how it's shot. It's very intense, quick cuts. The knife, especially when it's like coming at the camera, looks really good. And how they cut between the knife coming at the camera and then showing it going into her body. Um, it feels intense. It's very, and it feels very realistic. It's like a POV shot thing too, which makes it more intense. I really like how they did that. Um, Dr. Lodge talking about the killer's background as sophisticated it is and intelligent I feel like it's kind of a nod to the audience that Mickey is not the killer because he's not portrayed as sophisticated or um, intelligent in the film. He's very, you know, at the surface. He's also not trying to, you know, cover anything up. He's, he's very out in the open and very aggressive with going after the women. So that's kind of the nod to the audience that it is not Mickey, even though that's who you're thinking. I mean, that's who looks most... Uh, obvious at this point in time but the audience should also know that it's not mickey because of the whole dichotomy of donald duck mickey mouse i think that was an intentional thing that they used here the connection of the killer with the duck and the fact that mickey's name is mickey mickey versus donald they're not the same i think that's supposed to be a hint with the name of mickey I like the clever tw twist of the Ripper fooling the cops by using the walkie-talkie in the phone booth. I literally thought that they were going to end up catching him or, you know, almost catching him at that point. But when they get there and it's just the walkie-talkie in the phone booth, I was like, oh, cool. Um, and I also like the twist at that point, not long after you learn where, you know, Peter was using Mickey to get the women, which was a great smart thing by the New York Ripper to kind of put that separation between them. Uh, even further the razor cutting down the woman's forehead and over her eye is a pretty crazy scene uh it looks really good i mean obviously it was you know fake when they did it but they did a good job because they kept the eyeball moving around i i assume someone's manually manipulating the eyeball from underneath uh but it looked real it looked close to real it was it was pretty good and when they just go like down and all the way over the eye 
Uh, I can see that being pretty tough for some people to watch. Good job on that. Peter being the killer was foreshadowed in Faye's Nightmare, if people did not catch that. In her crazy nightmare, she ends up dreaming that Peter stabbed and killed her. So that is the foreshadowing early on. But it's easy for people to kind of forget about that as the film keeps going because they then keep throwing all these other red herrings at you. One of the other red herrings being how they keep showing Dr. Lodge playing chess. And very early on in the film, when they cut to him doing that after they had Williams talking about, you know, the Ripper... I thought that was a visual indicator of, you know, it's going to be Dr. Lodge. He'll end up being the New York Ripper. But that was wrong. So I'm glad that they threw some other stuff in here and it ended up not being Dr. Lodge. Lodge basically uh, says Peter created the duck as an alter ego to kill women because his daughter would never live to become one. Eh, was kind of my response to the reasoning behind the killer. You know, uh, I would be interested in other people's opinions. Did you like that about it? Did you not like that? I give it points for doing its own thing in that respect, having its own twist. And when you keep making Giallo films, it's a little hard to continually, you know, fool people or misdirect people or come up with new reasonings for why the killer is the killer. So, I mean, points for originality, I guess, but it, it's not that compelling in my opinion. Note that they focus on the duck figure at the girl, daughter's bedside. They intentionally do that and then pan over to her at one point. This is similar to the clue of the killer given in Don't Torture a Duckling, because like I was talking about, they also have a time where they focus on a figure, a duck figure, and then pan away. So, just saying. How seedy everything is enhances the overall gross feeling of the film. I already talked about that. The music is by Francesco Damasi. It is great. It doesn't match the material like most Italian horror films, but I love, love, love it. It bears repeating that I love the music. Kind of makes me want the soundtrack. Does that make me weird? Well, I have Spotify. It's probably on Spotify. I'll do that. And then maybe I'll just listen to some Goblin as well. To a degree, this speaks to the unhealthy way people lash out at society because of their personal hardships. Placing blame when there really is no blame to be placed anywhere it's just easier to focus anger outwardly. So I think really what you're getting at with, with you know, Peter going out and killing women because he's got this anger issue basically about how his daughter will never grow up to become a woman, it plays to this whole issue of people having a hard time dealing with terrible things that happen in their life that don't have a reason, that aren't facilitated by another human being that you can direct your anger at and take revenge upon. So in this instance, it's so hard for Peter to deal with that he basically, you know, snaps psychologically and creates this alter ego who places the blame on all women and goes after and starts killing them as kind of like a revenge, as an outlet to get the anger out, to get the frustration out, to make it easier to deal with. So I think that's basically what's at play here. Now, all that said, like I said, this isn't my favorite Giallo film, but... I enjoyed it enough. It, it was worth watching for sure. So out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a relatively solid three star rating. Um, I thought about going down to two and a half, but the fact that they, you know, kept it kind of fresh, did their own thing, plus the music bumped me up to that three stars. So three stars on the New York Ripper by Lucio Fulci. Good times. Anyway, put your thoughts down here. Uh, like I said, you're probably going to be seeing a lot more Giallo popping up on this channel because that's what I want to watch. I think my next one is, after this might be The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward by Sergio Martino. I think that's what I'm going to do, but I'm going to keep going. So uh, also put some recommendations down here for other Giallo films you think I should definitely check out and review, and I'll look into that. But um, regardless, I thank you for watching this. Do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button. It means so much to me to kind of grow the family that we're kind of building here of people who are horror fanatics, really. Uh, the whole reason I started this channel was for that reason. I don't have a lot of people in my area who I can really talk to about horror. So this is my way to reach out, find the nerdiest of the nerdy in horror, and, you know, start conversations about these things. So subscribe. I would really appreciate that if you like anything I've done. Also hit the notification bell and that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up a new review or an unboxing or doing a live stream or whatever. But regardless, I do thank you for your time. And until next time, keep it brutal.